So let's take a broader view now. Let's get the view of Hussein Haqqani. He served as Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S. from 2008 to 2011. He joins me now uh, from Washington. Ambassador, thanks for doing so. Uh, uh, Pakistan's civil and military leaders claim to have blocked militants, the Taliban specifically, from making further advances. But you see these large-scale attacks continue. Has there been a broad enough approach to fighting all the extremist groups by the government? Michael, unfortunately, no. Pakistanis continue to pay the ultimate price because of a wrong policy that has been in place for uh, almost a quarter century. Uh, Pakistan's military and intelligence services think that they can make distinctions between various jihadi groups, uh, those that are targeting Pakistan and those that target Afghanistan and India. They befriend one set of groups and they do not, uh, they act against the other. Unfortunately, the jihadis don't think that way and they basically move seamlessly between groups and every few weeks or months they try to show to the Pakistani authorities that they are alive and well, which basically proves that Pakistan's policy is inadequate and wrong. So it's not working. And we got this claim of responsibility by this one group, uh, Jamal al uh, Uhara. Now, this is a splinter group of the Taliban. There's been suggestions that they may have links to or sympathies with ISIS as well. What does this suggest about the movement of these groups? I mean, the Taliban isn't, there is no one Taliban. There's various groups within the Taliban, of course. And it's not just the Taliban. There are other terrorist groups like the lashkar e taiba which struck inside India not long ago, uh, jesh e uh, Then there are splinters of splinters. There are at least 42 groups that Pakistan has declared as terrorist groups, but it has not operated against all of them. The tehreek e taliban Pakistan, or TTP, was the group that bore the brunt of Pakistan's recent military operations and actions. It was a brave move by the Pakistan army, but the fact remains that either Pakistan moves against all jihadis or some of them will continue to bite Pakistan back as we saw in Quetta today. These groups operate either against religious minorities or against Shia Muslims or sometimes they move against certain professions and groups because they have an ideology and that ideology is simply not compatible with the idea of a modern Pakistani state. The sooner Pakistan makes no distinction between jihadi groups and operates against all of them, the easier it will be for Pakistan to eliminate them. So a miscalculation uh, in your view, what does this mean for the Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif? There are already concerns uh, over his health. Uh, he's also going to have to be uh, appointing a successor to the army chief. What sort of stresses are facing him in a political sense because of these uh, apparent failures of security in this region? Uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is facing a lot of challenges, but it's not just him. If he were to be replaced tomorrow by somebody else, that person would also face the same challenges. Pakistan's core challenge is to realize that uh, even in a highly militarized city like Quetta, which is the headquarters of the 12th Pakistani Army Corps, uh, where there are a lot of military uh, and intelligence personnel trying to deal with a nationalist revolt in the southern part of the Balochistan province. Even there, the Taliban can act and can act with impunity. Uh, well, that why, why is that? Is why is that, Ambassador? Thing. That That seems absurd. Well, it does seem absurd, but it's an absurdity that is tolerated by Pakistan's intelligence services' desire to have jihadis as instruments of influence for operation in Afghanistan or in Kashmir and India. And that basically is the error in the policy. Pakistan needs to realize that no jihadi, no terrorist is good for it, including those that it has sustained and nurtured for several years for regional influence. And, and, and you say, uh, I think your words were, bad policy is subsidized by the international community. Explain that for us. Well, for many years, the international community has thought that the way to win Pakistan over is by giving it subsidies. So give it aid. That is what was done when General Musharraf was in charge. Soon after 9-11, Pakistan acted against certain groups but did not act against others. And then many of the groups that had been banned resurfaced under new names. So the international community has essentially been trying to use carrots with Pakistan. The carrots have only worked partially and the fact that the international community continues to support Pakistan the way it has operated over the last two and a uh, quarter centuries 
the result is that Pakistan's policy is simply not changing. Uh, how much, uh, when it comes to Balochistan, uh, this, this sort of apparent haven for, for many groups, despite the military presence, how much does the local separatist uh, sentiment play into that as well? Well, we must understand the Pakistani army's worldview. It sees India as the eternal threat. It does not see the jihadis as a permanent threat. And so it is quite happy to use the jihadis as a means of containing the nationalists in Balochistan. Now, the Balochistan nationalists are not necessarily all separatists. Some of them just want autonomy within Pakistan and within the framework of Pakistan's constitution. But the army sees them as instruments of India to destabilize Pakistan. It operates against them in the process empowering jihadis. You must remember that the Taliban leader Mullah Akhtar Mansoor was found in Baluchistan province and taken out by the Americans not long ago. And even before that, right after 9-11, when the Taliban lost power in Afghanistan, they all moved to Baluchistan. I'm sure you have heard of the Quetta Shura that has been mentioned for many years. Been, been Unfortunately, pretty much all of since. that is coming back to Baluchistan. Uh, you know, if there's anything that talks, it's money. If, if you think the politics uh, is, is at play here, one thing Pakistan does need is investment. China is talking about $46 billion dollars in investment a lot of that going into this very region so that it can get oil and gas in and out through this region do you think this instability might cause china to get a bit nervous perhaps put pressure on the government quickly if you will uh, china has made promises of investment but obviously investment has to have returns and in an environment and security uh, investment cannot have the high rate of return that it expects at the same time, we must bear in mind that those who want to deny China space and uh, influence in that region may also want to undermine uh, China's projects. Uh, Pakistan needs to move far more carefully than its policymakers are moving at the moment, including in bringing China all the way to the, uh, uh, to the coast, very close to the Persian Gulf, and allowing it uh, access, unprecedented access in that region. Former Pakistan ambassador to the U.S., Hussein Haqqani. Thanks so much, Mr. Ambassador. Appreciate your time.